Welcome to Grand Rounds, everybody. <coughs> uh, today we get the pleasure of listening to Dr. Ronald Hobbs. <coughs> Fun facts about Dr. Hobbs. He said that in fourth grade he took second in his 100 meter dash. In uh, third grade, took second in the wiffle ball toss. Is that, those were his exact words. And then, I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that he was the second choice for the retina fellow as well. <laughs> so, um, you know, first one couldn't come, something like that. So, Ron's just kind of a second place guy. But uh, Ron, so this is Ron's last grand rounds here with us. Uh, he's been an awesome retina fellow, been great to work with and has taught us all a lot, so we really appreciate what he's brought to our program. And he's going to teach us a little bit about crystalline retinopathy. Thanks, Trent. You forgot to mention I was also my wife's second choice for a husband, but, <laughs> you know. Um, I just want to quickly give credit to Jim, to Jim Gilman for this picture here. I love this picture. Uh, he shared it with me last year. I remember when I came and interviewed here, and you get that view out there of the Salt Lake Valley. I just thought it wasn't even really fair to have like, a building like this and a view like this. And for other <coughs> places where you go interview and you're just stuck and you don't get a view at all. So I uh, love that photo. Um, first off, financial disclosures. I have none really. I don't get money from any outside sources. This is where all my money goes right here. Um, we'll get started. Patient one, um, this patient presented to the retina clinic here He's, with the complaint of my vision seems a little worse. A 56 year old male complained of uh, gradual worsening of vision bilaterally for about one year's time. He had been seen by his local doctor in a small town in Utah and was noted to have some retinal changes and so was referred to us. He really denies any other symptoms other than the blurriness associated with his vision. His past medical history, pretty uh, vanilla, you know, a history of hypertension. He did have a history of a knee replacement surgery a couple years prior. Um, there was con some concern over an infection in his knee that was cultured, but that had all long since settled down. Um, no significant family history. He has mild myopia, mild astigmatism. And other than that, he's just on metoprolol for his blood pressure. Vision, 2040 plus in each eye. There's no APD. Um, and the rest of the, the external exam is normal. And then anterior segment exam, he has uh, no inflammation. He has traits to one plus nuclear sclerotic cataract bilaterally. And the remainder of the anterior segment exam is normal. Uh, he does have asteroid hyalosis in his left eye. And the rest I'll show you for your enjoyment here. Here's the pictures. So picture the right eye here. Um, you can see these uh, glistening golden crystals kind of surrounding the perifoveal area, a little greater nasally. Um, you can't see it real well on there. You can see a vessel running here, retinal vessel, and crystals definitely uh, are superficial to that vessel there and, and again same thing here vessel running right here with crystals sitting superficial to it uh, and here's his left eye these aren't real uh, pigmentary changes of the retina here this is because of his asteroid there's areas that are out of focus in the left eye uh, this right here is is real pigmentary change in the retina but again crystals uh, surrounding the perifoveal region there Here's infrared a picture of both eyes again. You can see that slight pigmentary change there in the retina and, and these crystals throughout. Um, not quite as noticeable on infrared imaging as on color. Here's his OCT. Um, some pertinent findings. You can see he has these small cystoid spaces here in his outer nuclear layer and his inner nuclear layer um, throughout the retina. Additionally, you can see these little hyperlucent spots. These correlate with the crystals right in the nerve fiber layer there. Uh, every time if you go through and look at the cuts, you can see the line, the raster line going through, and you are catching little crystals uh, in the nerve fiber layer there. Additionally, you can see he has lost his photoreceptor segments there. Uh, his junction, his ISOS junction there is, is washed out centrally. 
uh, in his right eye. And here's his left eye. Uh, a similar picture, again, you have some little cystoid spaces, this one a little more superficial, some here in the outer plexiform layer, and, and some more superficial ones here as well. Again, these little crystals noted right along the edge of the nerve fiber layer, and he's got some photoreceptor dropout again. Not quite as significant as it is in the right eye. Here's his fluorescein angiogram, so early here at 14 seconds one minute, three minutes, and six minutes. But early you can see he's got some uh, little telangiectatic vessels that, that seem to fill here around uh, the central uh, fovea. At a minute you're starting to see leakage temporally. At three minutes it starts to surround the entire fovea and you have this petaloid pattern at, at six minutes. In the right eye and in the left eye, very, very similar pattern again. You have this early uh, hyperfluorescent spot, but you'll notice as you go through the through all the photos there. That doesn't expand at all, it stays the same. But uh, again, you have these telangiectatic vessels temporally, and, and you can watch those expand, that leakage expand throughout. Um, here's this fundosautal fluorescent. You notice you don't see any crystals on this. You do see some, some slight uh, pigmentary changes uh, in the macula in both eyes. And confocal blue light reflectance here um, really demonstrates these crystals more impressively than the other photos. But here's the crystals in the right eye and in the left eye. So differential diagnosis. Um, I put up here just the differential diagnosis for uh, retinal crystals. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. We'll talk about what this patient has. But, um, you know, I think this is a pretty good list to, to have in your mind when you see someone with crystals in the retina. So number one, canthaxanthin, not canthaxanthin, canthaxanthin. Um, we're in the United States here. And uh, that's usually associated with normal, normal vision. Um, talc, often very good vision as well. Primary hyperoxaluria, uh, usually that'll have just a very mild visual impairment associated with it. Methoxyfluorine as well, usually mild, although that can be significant. Tamoxifen um, also can be mild or can be quite significant depending on the, on the level of changes seen in the retina. And then some that have, uh, can have pretty significant vision changes associated with them would be bietes, crystalline dystrophy, uh, cystinosis, uh, bilateral acquired perifobial telangic cages. I know we, that name for this has probably changed five times uh, during some of your career. Right now we're calling it macular telangiectasia, MACTEL, idiopathic macular telangiectasia. So I'll refer to it as that throughout the, the remainder of the discussion today, but MACTEL. Uh, nitrofurantoin, another drug that when used chronically can call, cause crystals in the retina. And then some genetic diseases such as, uh, other genetic diseases I should say, such as Sjogren-Larsen, which is usually associated with uh, significant vision loss and uh, gyrate atrophy. For those of you who like to see it lumped into different categories, here's your genetic diseases, your bietes, gyrate, cystinosis, Sjogren-Larsen, primary hereditary hyperoxaluria, and then vascular, uh, MACTEL and TALC, idiopathic being a chronic retinal detachment, white dot fovea, toxic, you have your canthaxanthin, spelled wrong here, but tamoxifen, nitrofurantoin, uh, your secondary, secondary hyperoxaluria due to medications such as methoxyfluorine, and ethylene glycol, and then your metabolic disorders that can cause a secondary hyperoxaluria as well, associated with sarcoid or liver disease, bowel resection, renal failure. Our own Mike Teske here has a paper in American Journal of Ophthalmology on crystals associated with, we presume, excessive rhubarb ingestion. This was, was published in 1991, but a woman who would eat about six cups of rhubarb a day <laughs> really I liked. Have, I have her photograph. You have her photograph? I, I was looking at it last night. They were black and white, but. Um, but, but anyway, pretty impressive. It would be fun to see her now and see what she looks like. I don't know. She also had spinach. Yeah. Spinach. Yeah. Yeah. Spinach. Yeah. She ate a lot of rhubarb. So I don't have follow up on. I wish she was here to tell us what she looked like when she backed off on the rhubarb. But. But uh, for those of you who like rhubarb, try to keep it to one pie a day. So we'll, we'll go through the differential here and talk just briefly about each of these and, 
and, and the main manifestation. So first, tamoxifen. You know, this it's an anti-estrogen drug used mostly for breast cancer, but recently it's been used uh, as well for brain cancer with, with some efficacy. Um, in the past, it was used at pretty high doses, about 100 to 200 milligrams uh, a day. Now we, we've decreased that quite a bit to more around 20 to 40 milligrams a day, and we've seen that the, the toxicity has decreased as well with that. But most people who are on this, they're asymptomatic, or they have decreased central vision, color vision. Um, a recent study uh, on long-term, uh, not recent, but in 98, I should say, on long-term tamoxifen, you showed about 12% of the women who were on 20 milligrams a day developed the retinal toxicity. Um, what you see is you see these golden interretinal crystalline deposits. They're in the per perifovial region again, um, and they can be associated with macular edema, and with pigmentary changes. Um, the OCT demonstrates crystals in the nerve fiber layer and in the inner plexiform layer. Uh, in addition, with tamoxifen, you can see whirl-like changes in the cornea. Um, it's a similar drug to amiodarone that can give you that, and also to chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which we also know are associated with, with ret retinal toxicity, in that they bind to lipid. And it's thought that you get deposition of drug lipid uh, that, that deposits in, in the retina. So treatment for this, it's recommended that anyone who's on tamoxifen uh, be followed yearly with a retinal exam, and that if they do start to develop crystals, that we have an important discussion with the oncologist on, on the benefit of keeping them on the tamoxifen, because uh, at that point they can start to develop cystoid macular edema and they can start to lose vision. So, you know, it's need to have a serious discussion on whether or not to keep them on that. Um, on fluorescein angiography, when they have edema, you'll see kind of a pedaloid pattern of leakage. And the OCT can be very helpful for following these patients. You'll see CME and you can follow the progression, uh, the improvement or worsening with stopping tamoxifen, tamoxifen with, with OCT. Um, next is cantaxanthin. Cantaxanthin is a, it's a carotenoid derivative, it's used as an oral tanning agent. So most of the first papers uh, associated with toxicity for this were coming out of Canada. Um, probably because they uh, don't get any sun, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, a lot of people there were using it, uh, touting it, and then you started to notice uh, these changes uh, where you see retinal crystals uh, developing associated with its use. These crystals in canthaxanthin are, are usually greatest nasally. Um, but again, you can get a ring of them in the perifoveal area, uh, but, but more commonly you see them nasal between the fovea and the optic nerve head. Just about everyone with canthaxanthin crystals is asymptomatic. They hardly ever, they don't seem to pick up on it at all. Um, ERG can pick up some very subtle changes, but most patients don't, don't notice it or complain of it. Um, what you'll see is you'll see multiple inner retinal crystalline deposits um, around the macula and, and again greatest between the, the, the fovea and the optic nerve head. Uh, this is an older OCT, but you can see these crystalline deposits superficially here in the retina. Um, and, and when they've actually done histopathology on this, it looks like it is true deposition of canthaxanthin in the retina. You know, they were pulling out the canthaxanthin molecule lipoprotein complex uh, out of the retina. Um, and, and it over time, you can see some loss of, of Mueller cells, and that's why we postulate that the ERG uh, probably can be slightly decreased as well. Um, but like I said, the FA, color vision, patient symptom-wise, usually it's all, it's all normal. Um, so the recommendation, of course, if you see crystals, is probably stop the canthaxanthin. There are some people who have photosensitivity disorders that really benefit from canthaxanthin and the increased pigment. And so uh, when they need to be on it, they should be followed every six months. And uh, you can work on lowering the intake and, and work again with their primary care doctor on, on finding a balance if they need to be on it. But, um, and the deposits may regress or may not regress uh, with stoppage of the canthaxanthin. Next is uh, methoxyfluorane. We don't tend to see this very often, but it is, uh, has been noted uh, in the literature. This was an inhalational anesthetic agent used quite a, you know, it's, a, it's quite r old agent and pretty rare today. The main reason it's rare today is because when it's used on, on 
long surgeries, it tends to deposit these oxalate crystals that develop deposit in the kidneys. And the first symptom you get is they start to, patients during the surgery will start to develop kidney failure. And then uh, shortly after that, you'll start to notice um, you can get deposition of these crystals in the retina. Um, they'll deposit often within the arterioles themselves or just outside of the arterioles in the, in the retinal tissue. Um, usually they require surgery of over four hours to, to get to the point where these deposit. Um, and, and the past medical history of those who develop them usually demonstrates uh, renal insufficiency of some sort in the past. Um, again, this is a generalized crystal in retinopathy. Um, the crystals in this tend to be deeper in the retina and even subretinal, and then often are state, stay isolated in the, in the arterioles themselves. Um, you can get an exact, the exact same picture with ethylene glycol ingestion as well. Um, the maculopathy is not reversible in this. The primary treatment for this is prevention. So we don't use methoxyfluorine hardly at all, I don't think, anymore. I think it's just about become extinct. Um, and, and you definitely don't want to use it in patients who have renal dysfunction. Um, they've tried dialysis to get the, the improvement of the crystals without any benefit. <coughs> this patient here, this is a very pronounced picture. This was a patient who was abusing cocaine, so he had uh, really uh, damaged his kidneys from that and then was also abusing methoxyfluorine on his own on the side, and that's how he came up with such an impressive picture. And we won't typically see a picture like that, but but a uh, very pronounced crystalline deposition in his uh, ar arteries there. Uh, other one is nitrofurantoin, very rare, just a couple case reports in the literature and usually associated with people who are using it chronically um, it, as prophylaxis for recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, again, you, they had, both patients had both superficial and deep intraretinal deposits that were in a circinate pattern in the posterior pole. Um, we don't know just how reversible it is because it's just two patients that I could find. A cessation was recommended in, in both of those. Talc retinopathy. Um, talc, in order to develop the retinopathy, typically that's associated with the history of chronic IV drug use. Um, the most common one is Ritalin. So um, I was doing a little research on how people are getting the Ritalin, and, and I guess what the most common form, you can hop online and Google it, and you, all sorts of formulations out there for how to do it. But the most common uh, method that I could find looking at it was that they seem to crush the Ritalin in cold water, let it dissolve, try to filter it using a Q-tip head, the, the cotton end of a Q-tip head to filter out the particles. Ritalin it, it is very guilty of it because there's a very small amount of medicine to the filler. The pill itself is almost all filler. And so a lot of talc filler in there, but they filter it with a cotton head, inject it, you, they inject it either intravenously or intramuscularly, and, uh, and it's a lot of filter, filter that ends up uh, flowing around in there. So that what happens is the unfiltered suspension flows in and it deposits most commonly in the lungs. It can also deposit in the liver and heart valves. But from the lungs, over time it sits there and it, it develops, a, you develop an AV fistula, and then uh, that allows access to the eye, and you get these deposits that flow to the eye and, and kind of give you a spread out pattern typically in the macula. Um, sometimes the, the, the deposits themselves can be small enough to move right into the lung on the first usage, or of course, if there's any heart defects such as a patent foraminal valley or something like that, you could get talc that goes right to the eye. Um, but you typically, it requires repeated usage and, and time to develop the talc pattern. Um, and, and then what you can see in the retina is very similar to what you would see with uh, diabetes or radiation um, or hypertension where you get cotton wool spots, you can get capillary dropout, neovascularization, um, very similar to sickle cell. So here's another uh, picture of a patient. This was a 56-year-old woman um, who on retinal exam had these crystals on history. She admitted to uh, injecting some IV drugs uh, quite a bit in the past. Um, she ended up having a bilateral lung transplant. And so this is her actual pathology slides from her lung. And uh, what's interesting, you can see these, these are foreign body um, particles here. And she's got epithelioid uh, granulomas as well in her lungs. She had COPD as well. So it's hard to know how much of the lung damage. The, the, the authors thought it was mostly due to the COPD, but that the talc probably didn't have help the cause. And, and on her 
other slide here, you can see these are all polarizable uh, foreign bodies, very consistent with talc seen throughout her lung there. Um, so that's kind of what her lung looks like when her retina looks like this. Um, as far as treatment for it, uh, if you see talc retinopathy, you should probably follow them at a pretty regular interval because, and you could, a wide field floor CD angiography would be helpful to look for a peripheral uh, capillary dropout, uh, which would put them at risk for developing neovascularization. If you see it, you would treat them with PRP. Uh, there's not really any good treatment for the macular ischemia that can result from this. They can also get cystoid uh, appearance on the OCT like we've seen on some because these talc molecules can go right to the macula and, uh, and, and uh, you get loss of nut nutrients to part of the macula <coughs> and so loss of Mueller cells and you're left with these little empty cystoid spaces in the macula. Um, next, uh, macular telangiectasia. So it probably assumed to be more common than we originally thought. You know, when they went back and looked at the Beaver Dam study data, they said 0.1% of the adults, or one in a thousand, uh, over 45, had evidence of MACTEL, and that was just looking at color photos. If they looked at, if, you know, if we'd had SDOCT, we probably would have raised that number to a higher number. Um, there is some element of genetic inheritance associated with it, although we really don't understand it. It's not autosomal dominant. It's not autosomal recessive, it's not X-linked, we, we don't understand exactly how it works. But our own Dr. Bernstein was involved with a, a study that demonstrated that about one in 10 family members uh, of people with MACTEL will demonstrate MACTEL changes, even though we can't figure out the gene as of yet and we're not sure exactly uh, how the inheritance works there. Um, most often it's seen in healthy people, but there seems to be a predisposition to those who have glucose resistance, um, such as diabetes or other risk factors. Um, so, first described by Gass in the early 1980s, and then Gass and Blody in the early 1990s um, classified MACTEL into three different groups. Um, Yanusi came back later and made it two groups, which is easier for retina fellows all around the world to remember. I, I think of it as type 1 and type 2 now. Type 1, and the easy way to remember it is type 1 is unilateral. Type 2 is bilateral, so it tells you how many eyes are involved. But type 1 almost always unilateral. And it's a Coates-like symptom where you have uh, a male predisposition, you see the telangiectasias, and you get these uh, interretinal circinate exudation uh, right around the macula, though, in one eye. And then type 2 is bilateral. So in this one, it's 98% bilateral, a slight female predisposition, and usually seen later in life, uh, 40s to 60s. Changes that you see typically early, you see loss of the transparency of the retinal retina, sorry, then you'll start to develop retinal crystals in about 50% of people. Well, we'll end up developing those. Uh, you'll, you'll start to develop interretinal cystoid spaces. And then later in uh, stage three and, and further on, you'll start to see uh, leakage on the fluorescein angiogram. Uh, late changes are you'll start to get retinal thinning. You'll get pigment plaques like you can see here uh, on, on these photos, plaques usually in the temporal macula and you can also get uh, subretinal neovascularization, late atrophy, that would be stage five, the latest stage of MACTEL. Um, the retinal crystals can be hard to see. As I mentioned earlier, about 50% of people with MACTEL will develop them. Um, they do tend to aggregate temporally and, uh, and are seen in the, in the inner retina, right along the nerve fiber layer or just below there. Um, you also get these cystoid spaces that develop again. The thought is, so if you look at this FA here, you'll see the, the hyperfluorescence here. The first stage is you get thickening of the capillaries. You get more leakage and you get loss of the nutrients that the, the Mueller cells need there. So, you, so the thought is you start to get Mueller, cells drop, Mueller cell drop out. And then for, as a result of that, you start to lose the photoreceptors underlying and the RPE as well. When you lose the RPE, that allows um, some of the other RP cells around it to move up through where the photoreceptor dropout is, and that's what's thought to give you the pig pigment plaques that you see associated with it. Um, other things you'll see is a lack, of, uh, a loss of macular pigment optical density, uh, retinal transparency, and then, of course, leakage on the fluorescein angiogram. The most recent paper I saw, which was put out by the MACTEL study group, um, hypothesize that these, uh, these crystals are actually composed of retinoids from the dying Mueller cells. 
And so this is our patient again. This is an OCT I showed before, but you can see these uh, crystals superficial along the nerve fiber layer, um, loss of ISOS junction. And that same paper said that the loss of the ISOS junction is a big risk factor for uh, demonstrating crystals <coughs> in patients with MACTEL. Um, red free and confocal blue light reflect reflectance um, are the best imaging modalities to see those crystals on. Uh, whereas you see less on infrared and you really don't see them at all on fluorescent angiogram or fundus autofluorescence or ICT imaging. Management is uh, somewhat controversial at this time. There's quite a few people doing different things because none of it works great. For type 1, you can think of it like coats and it responds very similarly, similarly to coats. Uh, laser photocoagulation can be beneficial and anti-VEGF. Um, they tend to respond um, pretty well to those, whereas type 2 seems to be a complete different disease. It doesn't respond at all to laser. And I know um, there's a lot of disagreement amongst different retina specialists on whether or not they're injecting this with Avastin, uh, even amongst our own community. But uh, in general, it doesn't seem to respond at all to Avastin injections. And it's because the, the edema you see aren't, isn't true edema and leakage as much as it is uh, empty spaces left from, from loss of Mueller cells, although you can see leakage on the fluorescein. So Bietti's um, first described by Dr. Bietti in 1937. He had three original cohort patients he described, and they all had this triad of posterior pole retinal crystals uh, along with the tapetoretinal degeneration of the choroid and crystalline dystrophy of the cornea. Um, most cases of this uh, demonstrate autosomal recessive inheritance, although there is some autosomal dominant inheritance shown as well. Usually it starts to develop after 20 years of age and it's uh, slowly progressive. Very rare here in the United States or in the West to see it, uh, quite common in China. Um, the central visual acuity early is pretty mildly impaired and late becomes quite severely reduced uh, and nyctalopia often is associated with it. Uh, crystals are present in all layers of the retina and ERG shows progressive loss of both photopic and scotopic uh, amplitudes. The FA itself, you'll see uh, loss of the choreo capillaris quite late in the disease as well. Uh, and the visual fields, you'll see an annular scotoma. Um, so the biopsies that it have shown um, crystals that resemble cholesterol. And so one thought is, is this just a, a lipid metabolism disorder? But we don't know for sure exactly. The, the mechanism behind it. The management, currently there really is no treatment for it. Um, Dr. Burson, he, re he wrote an article where he recommended treating it similar to retinitis pigmentosa with <laughs> high dose vitamin A, which he thought might slow the ERG, but it's really um, not, not good data with that. There, it's not very well substantiated that you get much improvement with that. And genetic counseling, of course, uh, given the, the nature of the inheritance of it. And then cystinosis retinopathy is another um, autosomal recessive disease. It comes in three forms. All forms, you get cysteine accumulation within lysosomes. If you check the serum levels, you usually don't see elevated cysteine levels. The most severe is the infantile or nephropathic cystinosis. And they'll, they present pretty severely with loss of growth in the first year of life. And then they have pretty profound symptoms of photophobia, impaired vision, um, and then conjunctival corneal and posterior pole deposits of crystals, and the ERG is usually reduced in them. And then in the non-nephropathic form, it's not quite as, as severe. You get the corneal crystals without the retinopathy um, and without the, as, as much of impaired vision. For the most part, those patients do pretty well, um, and, and they don't have the renal dysfunction associated with it either. Most of them, those patients survive into adulthood and do well. Um, and then the intermediate or adolescent form, these patients usually present in their teens, and they usually have uh, only corneal and conjunctival deposits, although they can have some in the retina as well. And then, uh, of course, variable involvement of the kidneys, the retina, and, and other symptoms. So treatment of it, there's no specific treatment for cystinosis itself. Um, it's associated with acidosis that you can treat with bicarbonate. It's associated with renal failure in many cases and you can do renal transplant for that. The renal transplant itself doesn't stop progression of eye involvement and other systemic involvement as well. Um, and then, of course, cystiamine eye drops um, are very useful for the, for the cornea itself or the crystal deposition. Next, oxalosis. This is um, 
another autosomal recessive <laughs> disease associated with an error in glycoxylate metabolism. Um, so they have increased production of oxalate. Usually these patients, they know when they have this by the time they're seeing us for the most part. In childhood, they usually have repeated episodes of urolithiasis. Uh, by adulthood, they usually have had uh, kidney transplants due to kidney failure associated with such frequent ural, just with so many kidney stones. Um, the retinopathy seen in these patients um, is usually seen in childhood. And you get these crystalline deposits that are in the outer retina and in the RPE deep in the retina. Um, the definitive test is demonstrating increased oxalate on 24-hour urine samples. Um, they'll get severe visual impairment, but usually that's associated to optic nerve head pallor, um, not due to the maculopathy and the crystal deposition. That usually just causes mild vision loss. Um, there are a couple of papers recommending treatment with pyridoxine and oral citrate with very mild improvement, but not great improvement there. And then the regression uh, of the retinal deposits has been seen in patients who had renal transplantation. These are x-ray diffraction photos here showing these crystalline deposits along the area of the RPE there. Shogun Larsen, I've never seen this personally, very rare in the U.S., quite common in Sweden. 1.3% of the population is heterozygous for this gene there, and so uh, more common there. But it's an autosomal recess recessive disease. It's, again, um, they often have congenital cataracts, almost always have retinal crystals. Um, usually these patients are, almost always I should say, these patients are severely mentally handicapped. Um, they have spastic diplegia or, or straightening and stiffness of the legs. They have very profound ichthyosis, uh, dryness and scaling of the skin, short stature, speech deficits. You usually know there's one case report of, a, of a, an adult who did pretty well. Um, did, who had this genetic test done and had this, but for the most part, all these patients, when you're seeing them, they're handicapped patients in, in your room, and, and, and it's known that there's some sort of genetic abnormality. It's associated with an enzyme deficient uh, fatty aldehyde dehydrogenase, and they'll get these glistening dots in the perifoveal area. Um, histopathology has shown an increase in lipofusin granules ar around that. Um, again, genetic counseling recommended especially, you know, it, those from the Swedish area where the gene is so prevalent, and then uh, dermatology and neurology management for skin lesions and associated seizures. As far as the eyes go, there's some thought that supplementation with median chain triglycerides might uh, improve the visual potential in the eyes. We're getting there, I promise. Drusen, not really classic crystals, but you do get crystals late in the disease process, so I wanted to cover Drusen. Quickly, the drusen to build up between the RPE and the choreal capillaries, you can get drusen build up, basal laminar drusen, basal linear drusen, uh, depending on which side of the Brooks membrane it's on. I'll remind y'all, you know, I know a lot of you don't look at OCTs frequently, but here's your photoreceptor junction, your RPE. So you get drusen development right in this area here. Early on, drusen I think are pretty easy to differentiate from retinal crystals. Late in the, in the process, as drusen regress, you can get some brilliant crystalline formations in the retina. Um, Here's just a patient with profound drusen throughout. You can see that the deposition of these drusen uh, just under the RPE there. Um, and of course, it's associated with macular degeneration and geographic atrophy. West African crystalline maculopathy is a, is a newer one. This was described in the 90s. Um, in this, you can get bilateral asymptomatic yellow-green crystals uh, within the arcades in patients from West Africa. The original paper described uh, six patients, 12 eyes, who all had this. Uh, the question is what caused it. There's a lot of questions on it. We don't have a lot of answers. So some think that crystals pass through damaged blood retinal barrier. Most of the patients with this have some sort of associated uh, vasculopathy, whether it's diabetes or a history of a vein occlusion or fever. Um, and, and the other question is it due to ischemia that reduces flow through the axons and lets the crystals build up. Um, toxic causes have been uh, looked through, you know, at first they thought it was colonuts. All the patients who used it seemed to demonstrate to have a history of eating a lot of colonuts, which is this uh, addicting nut found in the West African area, and it has xanthines in it. So they thought maybe they're, they're getting a lot of it. But, but lately there have been a couple case reports of patients having it from West Africa and not having a history of any colonut uh, con 
ingestion, I should say, I guess. Uh, other things that they think might be associated, you can see the list there, but um, don't have a good answer yet on as far as what causes it. Um, again, this is the patient seen before. Here's his fundus autofluorescence. You don't see any crystals on that, which, which would be consistent with some sort of carotenoid or other process leading those crystals. And here on the OCT, you can see the subtle crystals here in Henley's layer, the layer, layer of the outer, um, plex, outer plexiform layer here and along the internuclear layer. A couple other things just for the sake of completeness here. Chronal, chronic retinal detachment can give you a classic um, crystalline retinopathy. Um, superficial de deposits of crystals, usually greatest in the macula um, and no deeper than the ILM. Uh, frequently seen with dialysis tears. Any, re any resident want to tell me where the most frequent dialysis tear would be seen? Infratemporal, you got it, exactly, infratemporal. So this is a patient with an inferior temporal dialysis tear. Um, you see the retinal crystals here and, and then further Examination of peripheral retina demonstrated that. This is one with a, a detachment leading up. I think this one might be seen even in the cornea clinic. It might pick up that detachment, but there's some, some retinal crystals associated with this one as well. Um, thought that maybe it's undigested photoreceptor cells. Again, two more pictures. Um, of course, the treatment would be surgical repair of the detachment. You could do that in many different ways. You could even laser barricade uh, a dialysis tear. They've done that in many cases, and the crystals usually hang around, although they're not known to be toxic in any way to the retina. Iatrogenic, so triamcinolone is a newer one we've been seeing since we've had the big increase in triamcinolone injections in the eyes. And with it, this is a patient who had a crotoneovascular membrane, received a triamcinolone injection, and you can see these fine crystals throughout the macula. On OCT of the same patient, you see these crystals uh, sitting on the surface of the nerve fiber layer. They're subhyloid and uh, you can get them with uh, Kenalog and also with triessence injection. It's thought to be um, associated more with the insoluble components of the triamcinolone itself, not with the preservatives that are in it. So you can see with either one. In this case, this is a, an article out of the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, but they followed this patient for six years. The crystals never changed at all. Didn't get any better, didn't get any worse. Um, the author on the first paper recommended doing a vitrectomy with membrane pill in order to get rid of them, but probably definitely excessive since they're not really associated with any, any visual problems. And then iatrogenic, um, this is the Tano diamond dusted scraper here. They've definitely been noted on the retina or in the retina following membrane pills in which the Tano was used. So Tano knew this when he first designed this scraper, he saw that these crystals would come off. These are diamond crystals, so I think any woman would love to have diamonds in her eyes, you know, you could sell it at that. But, uh, they're about 30 microns in size, and he saw them come off. So he, as part of the production of this, he would put it in an ultrasound machine to try to shake off the loose crystals. They're just loosely held on with, with a non-toxic silicone glue. Um, and, and so for the most part, they stay on, but, but there's definitely crystals that can come off when you're scraping it along the surface of the retina and be left on the retina. The recommendation, this is a patient who has two obvious crystals here after a membrane peel. The recommendation is to, you can just remove them with a soft tip during surgery if you see them. Uh, after surgery, if you see them, probably just leave them. They're not toxic uh, at all. Um, so our patient, we checked the serum creatinine. That was normal. <laughs> Good looking patient. And we did urine oxalate levels, 24 hour collection. The patient canceled that twice. So we don't have those for sure, although it'd be very unlikely in, in the patient, the CMP was normal. Sent to Dr. Bernstein because we think this patient has uh, macular telangiectasia. Sure seems consistent with it. So Dr. Bernstein, did you want to, uh, I know you're involved right now with the MacTel project. Did you want to mention briefly anything about that?
Any other questions or comments from anyone? 